I have such a reaction there to um, Glenn's music, always, always. I um, fell in love with a boy in an act of freedom um, several years ago. I was living in Boulder, Colorado and decided to spend the weekend with my grandparents who lived over on the western slope of the Rockies. And you have to understand the western slope of the Rockies is a place where the values such as freedom and duty and honor are as rampant as the winter winds. But it's a place I love and feel grounded in and return to frequently. On this particular weekend, I arrived and my grandparents were taking a nap, so I went for a run. And as I took off from their house, a four pod, beautiful, tawny dog came around the corner, big, floppy ears, deep brown eyes, and his tail wagging, and he said, I'll go with you. And we did. We ran, and we ran through the apple and the peach orchards that surrounded my grandparents' house. And we ran together for miles. It was one of the best runs I'd ever had. Well, I got back to my grandparents and discovered that this beloved dog was astray, had been hanging out in the neighborhood. Nobody knew where he belonged. And everybody was feeding him because, of course, he won over everybody's heart. By the end of the weekend, I knew that he needed to come home with me, and he did. He followed me running for the next 11 and a half years. That boy taught me so much about freedom, for he was always seeking freedom. Whenever we went on a long walk, he often would disappear, leaving me abandoned for an hour or two. But we went together backpacking and mountain biking and cross-country skiing, and he always found me again and again. He taught me about the relationship between freedom and love, freedom and comfort, freedom and security, and freedom and responsibility. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about freedom. It feels like freedom is at the middle of this knot of conflict of values and ideals that our country seems so tied up in right now. That freedom is one of those core values that we hold up as an ideal, but we rarely talk about freedom and its relationship to other things, other values, other ideals. And frankly, I think that may be a problem in not understanding what freedom is really all about. Instead, we hold freedom up as this great singular identity. The poet Alfred Lord Tennyson he wrote about freedom as a deity, as a great goddess that deserved our adoration and our worship. Freedom, he said, we worship thee, and so we do. On our own capital is the great statue, Liberty, that's been astride there since 1863, alone and strong, proclaiming out into the world, we are free in this country. That I'm going to counter, though, with a proclamation that freedom does not exist alone, that it is not in isolation, and it doesn't stand on its own merit. Freedom, it's a huge word in all seven letters of it, but in those relationships, we miss the discussion of how freedom impacts our lives in much more intricate and sometimes complicated ways. I think there's at least two dynamics with freedom. One is that it serves as a reference to something else, that freedom is in relationship to something else, and that freedom must have a counterbalance for it casts its own shadow. First, freedom embraces, it grabs, and it's tethered to American and human, human history, all of human history, through what it qualifies, free speech, Free press, free education, free lunch, free health care, free time, free range parenting, freedom of religious beliefs and practices. Freedom's closest kin in that family tree of values is, of course, liberty. We often hear the call and response, freedom and liberty. And liberty's great symbol in New York Harbor 
has beckoned and welcomed the tattered and the oppressed who are saying, here ye shall find freedom, finally. But of lately, liberty is more tied to the oppressive power of political and economic forces, kind of the external laws, and we've been about res resistance to any restrictions and oppressions that come from laws. Well, freedom has been more about a lack of internal, internal restraint, the push to pursue one's dreams as a hawk does when it takes to the sky. Too often, freedom has become equal to a dangerous form of hedonism. I might even venture to say the pursuit of self-pleasure. Feel free to do as one chooses without recognizing our accountability. But we know freedom casts a shadow. It needs a great counterbalance for it can do great harm. Even the cageless and carefree soul and body eventually meets its limits when there's too much self-indulgence. With the free ownership of guns, eventually people start to solve even the most minor of infractions with a bullet. With free speech, we gain a great deal, but we also risk being encouraged into turmoil and chaos and more violence. We also know that those tattered masses that came into New York Harbor were seeking refuge. They were seeking safety and comfort. Freedom, we know, is tied to a perspective. Which side of the barrier are we on? between us and freedom, which side of the wall? I'll give you an example. A few years ago, a study asked Democrats and Republicans about the value of freedom. And both, of course, exclaimed, yes, of course, we value freedom very highly. And when asked, what does that mean? Republicans responded with, freedom for us is about freedom from, freedom from tyranny oppression. And more particular, they said freedom from oppression so we can own our own guns, which is some of, one of the things that they agreed on. There wasn't a whole lot else they agreed on, except for that they did agree that there should be restrictions on women and black, women's and black bodies. And they weren't particularly fond of what gay men's bodies were doing either. Democrats, on the other hand, responded that freedom for them was about freedom of choice. They wanted choices, whether it be the number of cereals they can choose from in the supermarket aisle, or health care, or cars, or lifestyle, or choice over one's body and what happens to us. They did recognize that there needs to be some restrictions, but not many, on the rationale of individualism. But they even recognized that, even with the wide open expanse of freedom for all choices, that there are too many bodies on the ground that need buried. From the beginning of this country, we have been in this tension, this battle, on a perspectives about freedom, battling over our governance with our republic and democracy, classism, inequality, taxes, colonization, inhuman, inhumane and violent subjugation, of entire groups of people have been about battles over freedom from different perspectives. If you look at the battle of the immigrant coming into our borders, they are seeking economic freedom. And the business owners and industries are saying, we want economic freedom as well. But they look at it from the perspective of capitalism and exploitation. Too often, our calls for freedom have really been calls for self-indulgence and self-preservation rather than true freedom for all. It has cost human freedom too often. When economic freedom is untethered from the common good, we lose our perspective. Today, most urgently, I would say our republic is being torn apart by our value of voting, freedom to vote. We have proclaimed again and again that we want to vote. We want to vote. Give us our vote. And the foundation of our republic is built upon this very principle. But of late, the Republicans 
have said we value the vote, but in a ironic twist, they have been trying to protect that right to vote by restricting too many classes of people from voting. And we know that is a partisan goal, really. But the American people and their call to vote, that too can be doubted. In 2016, voters demonstrated really what their value of voting was when 43% of eligible voters did not vote. 43%, roughly that's about 100 million people who did not take responsibility for their vote and maintaining this republic. With each of our choices, when we come out from under the tyranny of oppression into freedom, there comes a counterbalance, responsibility, accountability. Freedom is always in relationship to another high value. When freedom is disconnected from accountability, disconnected from responsibility, from relationship, from purpose, then we start to do harm to one another. And if we truly want to understand that freedom is not just about hedonic relationship and happiness, that it is, becomes actually something truly fantastic. When we start to look at freedom for all of its complexity, we realize freedom has its own relationship with itself. It is actually paradoxical. Freedom is its own paradox. Poet Williams Woodworth reminded the artist that restrictions can be a gift. The poet, when restricted to just 14 lines of paradoxical freedom, finds that their mind is fine-tuned into something beautiful, stunning. When the painter's restricted to a few square inches, Jeez. their sharper vision becomes when the politician is restricted to one term or two terms, the time that becomes the most valuable commodity. And when the voter is restricted to just one vote, they find a stronger voice in public discourse. There is a stunning beauty found within the limits of freedom, a beauty that can be lost when given too much space to expand. That beauty is lost when we lose the scrutiny that comes from history's most honored judgments of pain and suffering. As Unitarian Universalists, our fourth principle says it is the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. The free and responsible. It is within our own faith that we recognize that freedom is held in relationship. Ultimately, we do always meet our conscience and the limits of freedoms, responsibilities, and the boundaries. In our human relationships, we become engrossed with our ethics, with our morality, with our fine values of duty and honor. Friendship and social ties that bind us to each other in our structures of community. And that's where we find the network of our fabric that has been woven together with tender, with angry, with bloody and passionate and dedicated hands and hearts. This is where we find our true freedom. Langston Hughes wrote a beautiful poem, epic poem called Freedom's Plow. And he calls us to remember that the call of freedom is heard by all and labored together. So he wrote, keep your hand on the plow. Stay true to the call of freedom, but we do not plow alone, he wrote. We build our land, we build our freedom together. So hold on. Nelson Mandela, another amazing leader, he walked the long road to freedom, he said, and he climbed to the crest of a hill only to see the many more hills ahead and the many hills behind him. And he realized the long journey of freedom and he paused and he rested, but just for a moment. And then he continued on for freedom's march. Freedom is not yours or mine alone. 
We are tied together in any revolution against tyranny and oppression, but we are tied together within the bonds of love and mutuality. Our ideals call us out of our darkest nights, and they are calls to us to keep the journey on, because I am not free until you are free. In this dark night, my friends, I beseech you, do not retreat into that place of fear and isolation. Your friends cannot find you. Do not retreat. You will fe feel pushed by the call of self-preservation. But I am asking you, please, you cannot be free. I cannot be free. I need you, and you need me. Lest we run amok out there in hill and dale with no place to rest our weary bodies. This is a team that we work on together. It's just one word, seven letters, but it bears so much for all of us. I'm reminded of a beautiful tale from Aesop, fables long, long ago, about a wolf and a dog. There was a hungry wolf who was always hanging around this village, but he was near starvation and weak. And all the dogs within the village were well fed and they guarded all the chickens and the pigs well and the wolf had nothing to eat and the dogs were well fed. And one day, a dog wandered a little bit too far from the village and met the wolf. And the wolf said, oh, he looks good to eat. I'm hungry. And he looked closer and said, oh, but I think he could take a serious bite out of me. So instead, he complimented the wolf. And he said, you look fine and fabulous, dear fellow. Yeah, the wolf, the dog said, thanks. You could look this way too. All you have to do is come into the village. What, said the wolf, what would I happen? What would I do? Well, you guard the people. You can be their companion. They'll feed you now and then. They'll rub your ear and scratch your back. Oh, the wolf thought that sounds wonderful. Tears coming to his eyes. And then he looked at the dog's neck and he said, what's that around your neck? He said, oh, well, that's nothing. That's a trifle. No, no, seriously, what is that? Well, it's a collar. It's how they tether me to their house. They chain me up sometimes. That's nothing. And the wolf said, what do you mean that's nothing? I will not give up my freedom. No, I took off back into the woods. Back into the woods alone, hungry, and isolated. We are in this relationship together, my friends, to choose freedom from tyranny, or we can choose freedom from tyranny together. I don't want any of us to be hungry and alone. I want us to be our hands on the plow together. So what is the purpose of freedom? That's what I asked. Well, that's easy. Marlo Thomas answered that question back in the 1970s, free to be you and me, my friends, free to be who we desire to be, but always within the bounds of love and confidential community. That's what purpose of freedom is all about. Let the deeper, more difficult debates and civil discourse begin, my friends. And I invite you, if you hear somebody call out for freedom, freedom, let it rain, I invite you to answer back just as strong. Freedom for what? Freedom and what? What is, what is this about? Invite people into a covenantal relationship. Freedom is coming, but it's not alone. I'll tell you that. It's bringing some friends. Thank you, my beloved. Blessed be. Amen. And hold on. <laughs>